Celtics Warriors. Um, it already is looking like it's going to be a really fun series. Simon, how fun was it just to be back with the Warriors in the NBA Finals and seeing this new up and coming Celtics team get there? It's crazy that they're finally here. I feel like it's been so long. And it, and to be completely honest, just jumped right into the shot quality numbers. I'm not wasting any time here. <laughs> they got better shots than the Warriors last night, which is just insane. Game one in Golden State, they got better looks. Uh, based off the quality of possessions both teams got, the Celtics win that game 88% of the time. So not only did they win the game by 12, but they also got higher quality of possessions, which is obviously going to be more predictive in the long run. I was also worried just because I, I, I'll be candid here. I want the Warriors to win this series. I love Steph. Um, and I was a little bit worried about the Warriors after the first quarter when they were only up, I think, four points after Steph blew up, had 21. Um, it seemed like the Warriors should be up by 15 and against any other team. Um, but the Celtics kind of stayed to the process and kept getting good shots, which um, and then it, it turned out where I mean, we can get into this right away. We were just talking about it after after the third quarter. Warriors were up, what, 12 points, and yet the shot quality scores said that Celtics should be running, right? Yeah, so the Warriors were up 12 in the third quarter, ESPN win probability, and now it fluctuates a lot. It's, I don't know, some people don't trust it, but 93% chance they had the Celtics, I mean, the Warriors of winning that game but at that point in the game, at the end of the third quarter. Based off the quality of possessions both teams have had at that point, the Celtics were up five. So that's a very good indicator that the Celtics were going to come back and then they totally dominated in terms of like they got their best shots at the end of the at the end in the fourth quarter. So in the fourth, uh, the Warriors scored 16, uh, obviously 40 to 16 run in the fourth quarter for the Celtics and the Celtics outscored them by seven on shot quality, which obviously accumulates to the 12 point shot quality win uh, in that game. And I want to get into that fourth quarter because I think it was really important and it kind of it might end up being a microcosm for this series. Um, the way the Celtics play defense, the way the Warriors are struggling to get good shots. But before we get into that, I want to kind of put some context to the series. Um, it came out a couple of days ago that the ESPN BPI, the Celtics had an 86% chance to win the series. And for me, just coming from, like I said, the eye test, someone who's not uh, looking at the analytics all that much, I was surprised by that. I just assumed that the Warriors um, were going to be the betting favorites. I'm, I mean, I feel like most people are putting their money on the Warriors and Steph to win MVP and all that. So it was surprising to see that even ESPN BPI had the Celtics um, as the heavy favorites to win the series. I mean, going into it, did you feel the same way? I didn't, honestly. I, I did think that the war the Celtics were the better team. I still believe that the Warriors would probably win out the series just because experience. This is more like eye test than anything shot quality related, honestly. The fact that they would win the series just because – I think they showed the stat at the beginning, like the Warriors have uh, their full roster is almost like 120 plus games of experience in the NBA finals or something like that uh, versus the Celtics of zero, which is just mad, obviously. Um, so just based off the experience, I thought the Warriors would have the edge, but based off actually the quality of both teams, I think the Celtics are the better team. Uh, and that kind of did play out, obviously, in game one. Yeah. And something uh, is fascinating is Tatum is obviously the Celtics superstar. Um, he struggles in game one, seemingly, but then when you actually look at the box score and, and kind of look more into the stats, he really didn't struggle. I mean, he had 13 assists, which is just unbelievable. And it's something that I've noticed a lot in these playoffs. Um, his passing has just gotten so much better as teams try to double team him. He's making the right reads, finding open guys. Um, so how important were those points that he created for his teammates compared to obviously he only scored 10 points, but creating those opportunities for other guys must have been really important, right? Yeah, so he average he got in that game. He created 18 expected passing points. But basically what that means, let's just say I passed it to you for a wide open three. Let's just say you're 40% shooter on that shot. Uh, that would be a 1.2. So basically he created a lot of points for other players, obviously based off assists, but also just like the high quality passes he made. So he created 18 expected passing points in an average game. Tatum creates around 11. So definitely... Uh, kicked it out more for open shooters, got it out Horford in the corners, Marcus Smart. Uh, the other thing that I will note that was a little bit concerning about the shots he was taking in the game, uh, if we are going to go on Tatum a little bit. So in an average game, usually Tatum uh, gets around uh, like 30% of his shots count as a great shot. A great shot would be um, nerding out a little bit, but would be in the 66th percentile or above. So that would be essentially a 40% three, 
for a 50 or a 60% two. So a really good shot. Tatum in this game basically had more bad shots than good shots, uh, which is just interesting because I feel like the Warriors did force him into a lot of the areas where Tatum's not at his best. He didn't take a lot of off the dribble threes, which he ranks in the 88th percentile in. Uh, took a lot of short mid range and like just didn't really get all the way to the hole. I felt like, um, and he still, even with that in mind, still out, out, underperformed significantly in the game. But obviously, didn't get the high quality shots that Tatum traditionally gets. And the the thing I think is so weird about that is that um, if you look at the Mavs Warriors series, something that the Warriors were doing a lot was when when the Mavs would set a ball screen with uh, with Steph's guy. Steph would hard hedge and try and get back to his guy. So they would they would do anything to not switch him onto Luca. And something I noticed in this game one, it seems like they were okay switching Steph onto onto Tatum. And so that's why it was weird to me that Tatum didn't take more advantage of that and and get better shots and have a have an insane game. I'm I'm wondering if that will kind of regress back to um, if the Warriors keep doing that. Um, he'll be able to get better looks and get to the line more. And obviously I think that's a big reason why he had 13 assists is because when Steph's on Tatum, all the Warriors have to come over and help. Um, but it was just an interesting little uh, tactic that the, it seemed like the Warriors adjusted to from the Mavs series. Um, obviously it seems like it didn't pan out in this game, although Tatum struggled from the field. I wonder what they're going to do moving forward with that matchup. Yeah, that is fascinating. I don't, I don't know. I'm surprised that they would ever switch. Curry. I guess Tatum is just like, Luca would be more likely to back down Steph and even just like get lower to the hole. Like, I guess Luca's just a stronger, probably interior presence. Obviously, he's a point guard, but like, just like a stronger yeah. than Tatum. Uh, and Tatum's more likely to settle for like those short mid ranges, even when it's a smaller guy on. I feel like that's kind of been a habit for his for a while, and he's definitely improved in that. Um, but still, yeah, that is a really fascinating thing that uh, they didn't, they switched Curry on him a lot. Yeah, and another obvious theme to the game, I mean, anybody who watched the game last night had to be surprised or shocked that guys like Derek White and Al Horford <laughs> seem to be like the biggest storyline. I mean, if those guys don't step up and make those shots, especially in the fourth quarter, it seems like the Warriors could have run away with the game with the way Tatum struggled. Um, how much did that affect the shot quality score when I think, what was it, Derek White was five for seven, Horford six for eight, which is a career game for Al Horford. Good for him. I'm happy for him. Obviously, I don't think it's going to happen moving forward. But how much does that affect the score going forward? Because, I mean, like you said, the Celtics, even before that fourth quarter, the Celtics still were winning the shot quality score. Yeah, this is a great point. Uh, so Al Horford in this game outperformed his shot quality by nine and a half points. So he was expected to score 17. So you're right on the money with him. And same thing with Derek White. So he scored 21 and was expected to score 13. So over, out, overperformed by eight points in this game. And the interesting thing with Derek White, I feel like you picked up on this uh, just like I test wise when we were talking about the game. He didn't take great shots in the game. He's, his shot quality ranked in the 27th percentile. Like a lot of his shots were just like puff, like, like some of them were open threes, but he had a crazy contested three with like three seconds on the shot clock in the fourth. Um, so he wasn't even getting like great, great looks. Al Horford was, he got a lot yeah. of open threes, uh, and Derek White got a couple, but, but the one you mentioned the end of the shot clock one where he kind of jab stepped and pushed off Steph a little bit, backed up and hit the three that it just felt like that was it. Like it felt like the game was over after that. That was so deflating, especially for Steph. I mean, I mentioned this, um, when we were talking before the pod, what, what's kind of a struggle for Steph and for the Warriors is he's constantly sprinting around the court and that's what gives them such great looks. But my worry is that sometimes he gets gassed in the fourth quarter because he's running around so much and trying to get those open shots in the first quarter. Um, I think the Celtics had a bunch of lapses in defense. Like there was even one possession where Steph literally just walked up the court into an open yeah. three, which almost never happens. If you compare that to the shots or the looks he was even getting, cause he didn't get many shots off in the fourth quarter it was night and day. Like he literally couldn't even get a shot off. Um, it reminded me of uh, Johnny Davis guarding me in the Wisconsin game in the tournament <laughs> after I went on that little run. Like I literally just couldn't get a shot off. Um, and I think that, so this all brings me back to my point. When Derek White hits that stupid shot on Steph, that contested shot at the end of shot clock, I could just see in Steph's brain saying, what the hell am I supposed to do now? Like I can't even get a shot off and they're hitting shots like this. It's just deflating. Um, and it sucks because he works so hard on offense. Um, for for a role player like Derek White, who's been great all playoffs, I have to say. 
um, to hit a shot like that. I just don't think that that's something that's going to be able to keep happening throughout the series. So how does that affect the game by game numbers as we go on? Like Al Horford and Derek White are not going to be able to do that every game, right? Definitely not. The main reason that the Celtics still won the shot quality by 12 is the Warriors outperformed the three point numbers as well. Um, so even though the Celtics, like Derek White, Al Horford, shot all over their heads for sure, the Warriors did too. So the Celtics were expected to score around five less three pointers than they hit, uh, just based off the quality of shots, who's taking and all that. And the Warriors basically were expected to score three less. Uh, and then there were some other luck factors as well, just from the free throw line, finishing around the hoop. Uh, so actually, both teams underperformed their shot quality by a similar amount. So the Celtics, uh, sorry, overperformed by 16 points. So they were expected to score 104. And the Warriors uh, overperformed by 16 points and were expected to score 92. So really interesting that both teams just shot like crazy, which honestly is just like shocking for a game one of the NBA finals. I feel like like entering a big game at the beginning of a big game. Uh, talk if you had like experience where just like the nerves of a ginormous game uh, I feel like people usually shoot worse uh, just because like right entering the NBA finals, right entering like a big March Madness game or even a conference tournament game. I think that that's definitely true. What I find interesting though, is it might actually be in favor of the Celtics that they have no experience. It's almost like they haven't been there before. They don't know what it's like to win or lose those big games in the finals. Um, whereas I feel like Steph, Clay, Draymond, they know exactly what's on at stake. Like they've lost NBA finals. They've won NBA finals. They know how important these games are. Um, it almost seems like the naivety of the Celtics might've come to their advantage a little bit. They're just out there playing. Maybe they don't have as much expectations because um, they've never been there before. Again, what I thought was interesting though, was even someone like Otto Porter on the Warriors we started out what four for four from three. Um, so it just seemed like these role players just came in with no nerves and, and just were getting up shots and making them. Um, although other than him, he had a couple open ones. It did seem like the Warriors were making tough shots. Um, we talked a little, a little bit about this before, but what do you think about the way that the Celtics are guarding Draymond? Um, I think this is going to be an issue for the Warriors moving forward. The fact that the Celtics like basically just aren't guarding him and letting him shoot threes. Um, how do you think the Warriors can adjust or what should they do? I think what the Celtics are doing, uh, leaving Draymond open, is a really smart thing. Obviously, uh, they know what they're doing, uh, their analyst staff. And when Draymond takes that open three, compared to the average, uh, compared to the average shot that the Warriors get on offense, it's a significantly worse shot when Draymond gets that than their average shot on offense, even when it's open, which is crazy. Yes. So the average shot in the half court for the Warriors, it's around one expected points per possession. When Draymond takes an open three, it's 0.8. So it's not a good shot, even when it's open for Draymond. Most of Draymond's threes, so he's at 29% on the season, he only takes open threes, really, which is why even when it's open, it, he doesn't even get that much of a boost because his average three is usually open and he's still shooting a terrible percentage. Uh, so the, the Celtics are going to continue to leave him open for sure. And Draymond's just going to have to probably off that, just not take it, either drive to the hoop or try to get Steph on a handoff, which he was kind of do i feel like in the fourth he got a little tentative and was trying to do more of that um and like even trying to reach like clay cutting and stuff like that uh which probably will be their best move and they're not going to sit draymond just because his defensive versatility and everything but um yeah yeah we need uh we need draymond to come back to when he was in like the 2016 season um i was looking at the stats he he shot almost 40 percent that year I, I just I can't believe the regression he's had over the past six years or so. I remember in even I think it was game seven, the Cavs Warriors series, when he was like the only offense the Warriors had in the first half. He had like five threes. Um, we're going to need at least one of those games for the Warriors if they're going to have a chance. Um, I just yeah, that that regression is really fascinating to me. Um, I think one of the 40 to 30. I think one of the most fascinating things from the game is just how the Celtics incredible defense basically forced the Warriors out of their game. So the Warriors, uh, they pushed the pace a pretty good amount. I, I know Steph had a couple of those long passes at the end of the game and a couple early, like those nice baseball passes, which are pretty sick. They didn't get a lot of transition looks, the Warriors in this game. So they got uh, the third, if on average, uh, if they got this many transition looks over the course of the full NBA season, that would rank 30th in the NBA. 
Uh, in terms of catch and shoot threes, the Warriors traditionally rank third in the NBA and generating catch and shoot threes. In this game, they were the 24th most that they generated on offense. That's such a big drop off. And obviously that's kudos to the Celtics defense, switching a lot and forcing a lot of off the bounce threes, which usually uh, would be a tough shot for most players. Obviously Curry not, uh, but still forcing those shots rather than the catch and shoots are pretty much always going to be a worse shot unless it's the outliers of like Steph Curry and all. It almost seems like the Celtics like took the Warriors game plan and made it their own. I mean, they, they um, took and made more threes. Um, another stat that I noticed was that the Celtics had less turnovers and more assists than the Warriors by nine assists. So they had nine more assists than the Warriors. And you think of the Warriors as like this insanely good passing team, which they are. Um, I think it's a credit to the Celtics defense, though, really. Um, they're all over Steph, all over Clay, uh, putting size on those guys, putting um, physicality on them. Uh, I think even Robert Williams has like three or four blocks. It just felt like the uh, the Celtics were everywhere. Their length, their size on the wing, especially, um, was really getting to the Warriors, and that's why I just found it so surprising that not nine more assists than the Warriors. Like that's got to be. I mean, that's that if that keeps happening every game, that's not going to pan out well for the Warriors. Yeah, that is really really, really shocking. Um, one other stat. I'm just going to keep Dawson stats that you talk. I want I want to quiz you here. You ready? Okay, let's do it. Who do you think in this game got the best quality of shots on either team? I'll give you I'll give you two guesses for the Celtics and two guesses for the Warriors. Let's, we can make it minimum. You want to make it minimum ten shots. So a single player that got the best shots. Yeah. So on the yeah. Celtics, I'm going to say Horford. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I mean, literally, if you just watch that fourth quarter, he's just getting open three after open three. Yep. Um, and it certainly wasn't Tatum because Tatum seemed like he was taking top ones. I actually thought Jalen Brown stepped up well in the fourth quarter, but I don't know if those were the best shots he was taking. Um, for the Warriors, I mean, I guess I would say Steph. Steph did get some open threes. <laughs> Okay, maybe you're the new shot quality. Maybe I don't even need I don't even need the algorithm anymore. You are shot quality. Hey, yeah. I told you I was taking notes during the game. I was locked in. <laughs> I knew Steph, what was going on. I mean, Steph always takes like great shots because just like whenever he takes even like a bad shot, it still kind of registers as a good shot just because he hits at such a high rate. Right. Uh, so of Steph's 29 possessions, including his turnovers, basically 17 of them registered as high quality shots above the 66 percentile which is just insane. I told you about Tatum at the beginning who had more bad shots than good shots. Uh, yeah, and you got Horford right too. Um, he basically just got open threes and knocked so, him down. Obviously. So when someone like Draymond takes a wide open three, according to shot quality, is that actually a – that's a bad shot for Draymond? Yeah. yeah, so Draymond in this game took 10 bad shots. <laughs> Almost all of them were his open threes. So an open three for Draymond is actually registering as a bad shot because it's a bad shot. I mean, yeah, like, see, that's what see, that's what I love about shot quality is like it takes away the bias. Like anybody could say, OK, Draymond taking a wide open three. We'll live with that. That's a great shot for us. But if you actually <laughs> if you actually look at it, that's not a good shot. You rather would, would you say this? You rather a contested step three than a wide open Draymond shot. It's not even close. It's not. It's so interesting. Yeah, yeah like it's that. not even close. Um, and I, I, I've like gotten slack from coaches about this, like just getting on pitches with them. Like they'll say to me, like, well, it's part of our defensive strategy, like leaving this crappy three point shooter open. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm like, that's a good strategy. And like, we'll register actually on the system as a bad shot because they're bad shooters unless they actually are a good shooter. Uh, so yeah, Draymond's like one of the best examples of that, uh, leaving a good guy open. I mean, a bad shooter open is still actually a good defensive tactic. And I'd say most coaches obviously would recognize that. I think that's something in the college game, especially that we lock in on is we call it. So at Colgate, we call it a super help guy. If the other team has a super. So let's say Simon was on the other team. He would be <laughs> he would technically be a super help guy. So basically, we wouldn't have to guard him. We could just sit someone deep in the paint um, that can play help defense. And I think that's what's happening to the Warriors right now with Draymond there, whether it's Horford or Robert Williams, whoever is guarding him can literally just sit in the paint and clog things up. Um, and it's it's so helpful. Like when we're doing scouts for the other teams, the one thing I always look for is do they have a super help guy? Because it's just it just helps so much. If so, if someone gets beat, there's always going to be that extra defender. Obviously, you got to be sure that they're not going to be cutting or doing other things, setting screens because you can get behind if you're not um, up on them on defense. But it just makes such a difference. And that's why I don't know. Is Draymond just a liability in this series? I don't know. 
And that's the part that just like it, that ruins the gravity of the offensive team when you have that super help guy because you're basically every player usually has three decisions pass shoot or drive yeah um and draymond basically knocks off one of his decisions so if he's not going to shoot and they know he's not going to shoot then from a defensive perspective it just changes the whole gravity and obviously steph uh when he's on the court like changes everything because basically you have to hard edge any single time he's coming off a screen or anything um so conversely Draymond just negates that so much on the offensive end. Uh, so maybe they'll start doing more short roll stuff with Draymond. That's, I feel like when they're the Warrior offense at the best, cause he's such a good decision maker. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't see too much of that. I remember like, that's usually when they get their most cuts in the game is when Draymond's the short roll guy. Uh, I mean, Draymond had five assists in the game. Uh, but uh, I feel like they should start doing a little more of that probably. And what the issue also is that Steph is such an unselfish player that, if he drives in and sees that help defender, he's always going to pass it to Draymond because that's just like in his nature. But maybe he should be taking a little bit of a harder shot instead of passing it to him. Um, I also just think that one thing that Draymond can do, and this is what he, he does this anyway, so it's not like um, this is anything new. But if you set really good ball screens or those slips like you're talking about to short rolls, that's how you get the defense behind. Like um, if a guy is in super help and you quickly pass the step instead of ball screen, that guy is going to be late getting back up to the screen. And I think that happened a couple of times, actually, in the first half, especially when Steph got those more open threes. It's, it seemed like the Celtics were too far back. Um, obviously, it didn't end up affecting the game that much, but it did seem like there were plays where Steph was getting those open shots. Um, so I think Draymond just has to figure out ways to be a, you know, a, a dribble handoff guy, a ball screen guy, um, like he does anyway, but um, Steph's just got to have to be more aggressive. I mean, he already was aggressive, but <laughs> he and Clay and the, the, Wigg, I mean, Wiggins too, um, just going to have to be more aggressive. Wiggins like, took great shots. I actually had this argument. I mean, you brought this up on the other pod, but I had an argument with my friends about it when we were watching the game was uh, Wiggins, like you mentioned this example of like the Wiggins paradox of like having a guy who's just like, when he goes to another team, like everything I feel like in the draft is based off fit. Obviously like there's certain, like there's certain skills and athletic ability and shooting ability. Like there's obviously skills that are real, but so much of it is just fit. Like we were even talking about like, is Kevin Knox a bust if he's drafted by the Warriors? Like, because like, I feel like someone like that, obviously like just inherently bad, but like, I can only imagine like Kevin Knox watching this game and being like, like everything is just like feels probably like in rhythm and easy for someone like Wiggins like he's getting an advantage on his guy I mean obviously Wiggins is more athletic than Kevin Knox uh but like yeah I'm worried about your little comparison to Kevin Knox here but go on <laughs> not not even in like the actual player itself but just like the fact that like fit matters way too much to just like call people a boss and, and then like it becomes a confidence thing as well like when you suck on your first team it's kind of hard to come back from that obviously a lot of guys do uh but it's just like totally demoralizing yeah i definitely agree i mean look at wiggins had 20 last night i feel like he was getting good shots and he, he even missed i feel like a couple open threes that he could have made um he's going to be really big for them especially uh defensively too i feel like guarding jalen brown and jason tatum um and i think he did a good job actually i think he was probably other than steph the warriors best player last night which is interesting clay is definitely the thing I've noticed with Clay, I don't know if you agree with this. Um, you could probably look at, I don't know if you can pull up the shot quality numbers now. I just feel like he's taking tougher shots than maybe he, maybe he's taking the same shots that he used to. Um, but it just seems like he's not making the tough shots that he used to. And I don't know if that's just something, obviously he didn't play for two, three years. Um, but it's just something I've noticed is that like he's short a lot on those tough shots that he used to make. And he's making the open ones still like he always did. But he's not getting hot as much, which I don't know if that's just something I test I've noticed. But no, I mean, I was on a podcast uh, yesterday and I was actually talking about this, just like how the shot quality numbers tend to adjust when the players just like isn't the same player. So like Clay is an example of that where like he didn't play for like three years um, and he's not like he's still good off the dribble three point shooter. But like he's just like he doesn't create. He's not a good cutter anymore. He just doesn't have the same athletic explosion. Obviously, his three-point shot might come back, but he's, like, stay, sticking around, like, 36%, 37%. And he's just, like, not been the same guy uh, than before. Like, like he just doesn't create the, as much, like, space, even when he's pulling up from mid-range. Like, even his mid-range looks, like, more difficult shots than, like, Clay usually in rhythm in the past has been. And, obviously, it's a hard journey coming back from all those injuries. Uh, but, yeah, no, that, that is a really fascinating point with him. 
I also just looked up one stat. Uh, the Warriors in this game got the second worst quality of possessions they had the entire season. <laughs> entire season the other game was on um may 11th um so uh, like insane like like this is like in the nba finals they got their worst quality shots and that it mostly comes down to what i was saying at the beginning just not generating as many of those catch and shoot looks that they traditionally do and also that the the reason that's fascinating is like it's not like they were getting good shots and missing them they actually just like weren't getting good shots um which i think that's like the problem that's going to be the problem going forward is this the celtics defense is just on another level um and i think there's adjustments that the warriors can obviously make but they were trying their their normal slipping screens and setting off ball screens they were getting some of them but the celtics were just really good with their switches and they were doing a really good job at obviously scouting um i think he may have done a great job but um that's why i'm concerned and as we like give our predictions towards the end of this pod <laughs> like i want to say that there's like you know uh, light at the end of the tunnel for the Warriors, but I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, just based off the shot quality scoring game one, I I would be surprised if the Warriors don't just like shoot like crazy again, uh, and maybe the Celtics come back to earth a little bit. But um, just from the defensive numbers I've seen in game one, uh, I think the Warriors. I mean, the Celtics have got to be the favorite in the series moving forward now, um, and just how well they match up. So, like, I I would if I had to predict the series out now. Um, trying not to fall victim to recency bias here, just saying what I'm thinking and just based off the numbers here, I, I guess the Celtics in six, uh, six or seven would probably be like the most likely like Vegas uh, odds for sure. Yeah, I think I, it sucks to say, but I have to agree with you, especially the Celtics stealing one um, in, or I guess in uh, San Francisco now. Um, that's definitely going to be an issue. And, and what I noticed too, is it felt like Steph was having one of those Steph games where um, whatever he hits seven or eight threes, sometimes more uh, and the Warriors just start to blow a team out. And the fact that the Warriors just could never get over that hump. I know they got up by 13 or 14 or 15 at one point, but they just could never completely blow the game open. The Celtics found ways to get stops and get um, and make shots. That was the most concerning thing to me because that, that just tells me that even if Steph does have a 40 point game, the Celtics could still easily win. And in the past, that kind of hasn't been the case. It feels like when Steph blows up, the Warriors always seem to win those games. Um, and so I kind of have to agree with you. I would say at this point, Celtics in six. Um, I hope that the Warriors can find a way and Steph can get his finals MVP. But um, that just seems like where we're headed. Absolutely. And we'll be doing another pod probably after game three, uh, recapping the first three games of the series. And we'll see uh, how the shot quality numbers are produced predictive uh is the war shooting over expected are they shooting under moving forward and we'll go from there yeah i'm i'm really curious to see what adjustments the warriors make it seems like the Celtics can kind of keep doing the same thing especially as tatum kind of um regresses back or up <laughs> to uh where he usually is um that will be fascinating to see how the warriors can make adjustments because they're going to have to do something um i don't think draymond's going to be able to keep taking those shots and um, Clay's going to have to do more. Poole's going to have to do – Poole's going to have to have a game where he has 25 or 30 for them to win a game. Um, so, yeah, just very exciting. But at the same time, I, I'm just loving this series, and I love these two teams. I, I feel like either way it goes, I'll be happy. Uh, it's just two really fun teams, and that's all you can ask for in the finals. I mean, I actually didn't even see this. Poole took terrible shots in this game. He was <laughs> in the eighth percentile of quality of shots in this game. And he's like a super efficient player traditionally, like pretty much all of his shots. He takes either a drive off the triple short mid range, long mid range. It's just the South like defense really got to him. Uh, I'd be interested to see if he gets more aggressive, if he could start getting better looks. Um, and that's the type of guy I feel like maybe Draymond's like lack of gravity on the court kind of hurts a little bit. Um, like that might be like the type of player. I don't know. They're not going to take yeah. Draymond out, but. Well, also because pool is like used to isolations and it's, harder to do isolations when there's that extra help defender exactly. like you can be more aggressive up on pool because you know you have help behind you and so that's why someone like pool struggles i mean against another team he might be getting the, those shots might be more open even the shots that he's taking he could take the same exact shots and they might just be more open because the defense isn't there um or those guys you know just aren't as as athletic defensively 
So those are things we'll look forward uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, it was good to be back. Good to, good to have the NBA finals back. Um, and Simon, I hope you have a good rest of your week. Uh, we will see you guys next week at some point, hopefully after game three. Have a good one. Whoa. All right. I might, uh, I might end up redoing the ending, but that was good. Yeah, that was good. That was perfect. I thought it lingered.